Okay. Can you guys see that? Awesome. All right, so thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna to be emphasizing kind of like the, the resiliency of Chinese Americans in, in rural Oregon. Um, and kind of to begin, I wanna quickly go over some Chinese American history. Um, so Chinese immigrants started coming to the United States as early as 1785, first to the East Coast actually, as seamen and students, but then in much larger influx during the mid 19th century when news of the gold found in Sutter's mill in California California had spread to China. While the socioeconomic conditions and political unrest and the natural disasters in southeastern China during the mid 19th century encouraged the Chinese in the Guangdong and Guangxi region to seek opportunities elsewhere, the increased migration out of China was not solely due to these circumstances. Chinese people in this region have a tradition of going abroad for opportunities, but that scale of migration um, took increased mostly from traveling to Southeast Asia to a much larger global scale that really included the Americas, New Zealand, Australia, and other countries. During this time, most of the Chinese immigrants came from the region in China known as the Pearl Delta region, which you see here in this map. And it consists of Samyap, Sezyap, and Kyongsan districts in the Guangdong province, which you can see labeled. Now, understanding that Chinese Americans came from these different areas of China is a really crucial element in understanding the experiences of Chinese Americans for a few reasons. And one of which is that although the misconception is that Cantonese is largely understood everywhere else, the truth is that each region really had their own dialects of Cantonese, not all of which are completely interchangeable with one another. Second is that each region also had their own unique cultural practices. And finally, a lot of Chinese immigrants created various forms of organizations and associations that I will elaborate further on, some of which are based on their home villages. Um, in terms of migration to the Pacific Northwest, small numbers of Chinese immigrants began going to Northwest also as early as 1788 for short-term jobs such as carpenters, shipbuilders, blacksmiths, or sailors. When the gold rush in California reached the Siskiyou Mountains, which is borders between California and Oregon in the mid 19th century, Jacksonville and Sterlingville began to have um, Chinese communities and specifically miners. Um, during this time, Chinese immigrants worked variety of jobs such as merchants, miners, farmers, restaurant owners, day laborers, railroad workers, or even or including running laundromats. While the most of the notable Chinese popular areas may be places like Portland or Astoria, historic records show that Chinese immigrants really traveled all over Oregon. Um, like I said, part of the Chinese community structure that was created during these migrations was the formation of a lot of different types of organizations, such as the ones listed here. These really vary in range in terms of kind of like their audience. Um, there's a lot of like secret societies or the Tongs. And like, for those of you who are a little familiar with Chinese American history, you might've heard of like the Tong Wars. Um, there's also county and district origin groups, um, the, so just what I referenced earlier, and merchants and civic leader associations the most um, famous one is the CCBA or the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Associations, which is still active in some parts of the U.S. today. There's clan or surname associations, which some are also still active today, temples and shrines, progressive political organization, missionary churches. And these organizations served a really important role in the Chinese community because of they controlled a lot of the trade of goods, the movement of labor, and ultimately protection against discrimination. <clears throat> um, now we all know that from history that Chinese immigrants were not particularly welcomed, most famously the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Gary Act of 1892, specifically prohibited Chinese uh, immigrants from certain immigrant classes from coming to the US, although merchants and students were still allowed to come. And on this table, you can see the list of all the federal legislation that impacted Chinese immigrants. In particular, I wanted to highlight the 1878 INRI IUP, where the American legislation basically racialized Chinese Americans by deeming them as Mongolian, uh, Mongolian, therefore like not able to have the rights of Caucasians. Um, 
On the state and local level, specific to kind of Grant County in Oregon, um, Oregon implemented a poll tax as a means to discourage Chinese immigrants from working or owning mining claims, which is also really similar to a lot of the local John Day legislations that were basically like prohibiting Chinese people from working the mines. Other nearby states, such as California, Washington, and Idaho, also enacted similar anti Chinese state legislation. And situating the Chinese experiences in these legislation remind us of the the restrictions that Chinese immigrants had, including how it may have impacted their day-to-day -day decisions, such as purchasing or consuming various goods, and therefore kind of the material records left behind. Um, However, despite the structural racism and obviously all the other over type of discrimination that we see in newspapers all the time that I didn't put up here, um, but Chinese people were really resilient. Um, and shown here are two quotes that really show the drive and the pride that Chinese people have for going outside the work, one of which is the Hakka drum song. And for those of you unfamiliar, Hakka is another quote unquote like minority within Chinese. Um, and so here you can tell like there's just a lot of pride and like the idea that like, you needed to go through hardships is really built in their their culture in this culture and um the second one uh is a very is a common cantonese saying um to the point that like i think even though i'm not cantonese but i've heard some version of this growing up and like chinese people ultimately do take pride in their quote unquote ability to quote unquote eat bitterness which is to take in a lot of that hardship um which i think really translates into their resiliency um, and now I'm going to show a couple of uh, examples of Chinese diaspora ceramics. So these are the sites that, these are the type of ceramics that we found most commonly on our Chinese diaspora related sites. Um, and the four her that you see are the Ming Yao porcelain or, or also known as folkware. Um, and another type that we commonly see, that we see a lot is the Chinese brown glaze stoneware. And here we have an example of a jar. Now CBGS, you can kind of think of like almost a redware of a lot of archaeological sites where you see like fragments of but the thing is like they can come in such variety of vessels and uses that you know like there's some that's very like diagnostic where we know um but others they can be a little more ambiguous like they can include like small various like spouted or wide mouth jars to these really large shipping containers and they held everything from wine soy sauce vinegar fermented soybean ginger oil or liquor that's over 90 percent proof just to list kind of a few possibilities. Now the Mingyao porcelain, um, the most four common ones that we see are the ones listed here. The double happiness and the bamboo are most commonly only in bowl vessels, whereas winter green and four seasons kind of have a greater variety in terms of vessel forms. Um, these porcelains are not only found in the context of Chinese diasporic sites in the U.S., but they're also found in China and are very distinct from like the fine Chinese porcelain produced in the imperial kilns of Jingdezhen, and like very different from like what a lot of people think of as export porcelain. Um, so my research specifically focused on particular classes of artifacts across different archaeological sites. And the site that I used is includes the Chinese Jacksonville Chinese Quarter, um, four different mining sites in the Malher National Forest, which are listed here. Um, and the Kamwa Chung Chinese ledgers. Um, and the Grant County Euro-American English ledgers. Um, and I also use materials from the Kamwa Chung Museum itself. And here's a very broad location of where kind of the two areas are. The one the south there, like that's where Jacksonville is located, whereas the other one is really where the Mauer National Forest and the Kamwa Chung is. <clears throat> Now, excavated in 2011 and 2013, Jacksonville Chinese Quarter site was a building that dates to the 1860s that was abandoned in 1888 when it burned down. Um, the building sits on a section of Main Street known as the Chinese Quarter, and the Chinese, the Chinese Quarter um, and the area southwest of the Jacksonville by the Upper Jackson Creek was almost exclusively Chinese by 1864. And this is all mostly due to miners. Um, and this increase in population created a need for food, clothing, and other goods. 
And according to scholars, Chinese merchants were listed on the census, but their locations are unknown, unfortunately. Um, the, Chinese, the Jacksonville Chinese Quarter site itself served as a regional supply for Chinese migrants. Uh, sorry, served as a regional supply hub for Chinese migrants working in the area. Um, and various accounts and census data indicate that 1860s and 1870s, the population of the Chinese in the area were in the hundreds, but by 1880, the population was down to 49. Um, during its height, Chinese immigrants in Jacksonville worked a variety of jobs that included minor, barber, doctor, several clothes washers, cooks, servants, laundrymen, boarding housekeepers, merchants, waiters, gardeners, physicians, or artists. So we can really see like kind of the variety of occupation that Chinese people uh, really, really took part of and engaged with society. Um, in John Day, Oregon, um, Chinese miners began mining the area by 1860, and according to federal mining reports in 1872 and 1880, most of the mining in Grant County, Oregon, had been done by the Chinese. Um, similarly, the according to census records of Grant County in 1870, Chinese people constituted 42% of the population, but 69% of all miners. And by 1880, even though the Chinese population had decreased to representing only 21% of the population, Chinese mining presence in increased to 80%. Along with miners, Chinese people with other occupations also began, com began coming in, one of which were, of course, the stores. And Kama Chong Company here um, was one of the many examples. Kama Chong Company was established in 1871, and by 1883, there were advertisements for the business in Grant County News. Records show that Kama Chong Company was bought by Liang Ung and Ying He in 1887, and the business quickly became not just a store, but really provided a series of services for local Chinese residents. And these include a hiring hall for Chinese labor, a religious shrine for Buddhist act, sect, for a Buddhist sect, a social center for discussing topics related to the homeland, a post office, a place to arrange loans and gamble, and an apothecary for Ying He to run his Chinese herbal practice. Um, and so all the materials that used in this analysis are from this museum itself when the building was reopened and the ownership was turned to Oregon Department Parks and Recreation. Um, and because the collection at Kam Chong itself is a time capsule dating to when the building was abandoned in the 1940s, the material assemblage really includes things from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century and has uh, materials not just used by the Chinese, but also the non-Chinese population in John Day. Everything in the store was cataloged, including different types of storage containers, such as boxes, cans, and jars, as well as other items that archaeologists don't temporarily see in an assemblage such as like complete furniture or paper, paper decoration and calendars. Um, written records used in this project consists of store ledgers from Camelot Town in the series of English ledgers in the same county. Um, and the Kamwa Chong, or sorry, and here's a picture of the two store owners, Liang Long and Ying He. And they were incredibly famous um, in the local region. And actually a lot of people, not just like Chinese patients, but like non-Chinese patients actually came to John Day just to actually seek the help of Ying He because he became such a notorious um, local doctor. And Liang Ang was also a really famous businessman around the area and like owned his own like automobile shop and stuff like that. So really just like defying every possible stereotype that you can possibly think of. Um, now the store ledgers that date to the Kama Chong, there's a total of four store ledgers in this um, assemblage that date from February 1887 to August of 1889. However, only three books have been translated and these are written entirely in traditional Chinese. Um, and now I'm gonna kind of quickly go over some of the ceramic representation. Um, so neither the Kamwa Chang ledgers nor the Grant County ledgers have any item that would technically be what archeologists would consider as like food storage, um, such as CBGS. Um, and this is due to the fact that, you know, the ledgers represent the food 
within as opposed to the containers themselves. So anything that we see that is like dried or preserved Chinese import good, imported goods likely had CBGS as a byproduct. Um, in terms of the ledgers, the majority of the tableware listed in the Kama Chong are Mingyao porcelain with specific reference to winter green and something that is translated as a plum decorated bowl. Um, but most of them are left without a descriptor. But there is a listing of quote unquote pan bowl, which is translated in a different inventory um, as barbarian, and the character generally means foreign, which basically means that Kim Ma Chung did stock non-Chinese tableware. Um, and, and there was only a total of six things that like archaeologists consider as food props food prep or consumption um, purchased by Chinese immigrants that were listed in the English Grant County Euro-American ledgers. That includes two saucers, uh, one plate, uh, small, quote unquote, small dishes, a butcher knife, and a frying pan with no specific uh, manufacturer or cultural label. Um, and tableware in the mining camps is represented mostly by Mingyao and includes a typical type of ceramics. Um, the presence of the Mingyao porcelain at the mining camps but on the Kim Ma Chang ledgers shows that Chinese miners may have brought these from a previous network that the tableware not purchased locally. Uh, Chinese miners were likely seasonal and traveled um, region to region following mining resources. Therefore, it is possible that material remains that these mining camps are not from local purchases. Except for, for a metal lunch pail at one of the mining camps, all the remaining food storage were also, or just CBGS. Um, <clears throat> but also that's because th there were a high amounts of like glass containers, but as we all know, glass can really be anything. Um, so labeling them as food storage can be a little more difficult. Um, so CBGS is the dominant food storage artifact, at least as far as we know. Um, but that also really indicates the extensive network of Chinese that they've established throughout um, and their ability to kind of like carry these foods or the, uh, the importance of kind of this. Um, and that they were using CBGS to move materials across the different geographic locations. Um, the vast amount of documents at Kim Chung to and from a large range across Oregon, California, and Seattle really further demonstrates this network. Um, but unfortunately, due to limitations of preservation, excavation, and time, only one botanical analysis has been conducted across the four camps, of which the only findings are local plants. Um, so instead, really like insights to what they were purchasing for consumption is provided by the store ledgers at Kim Chung and Grant County stores. Um, in comparison to artifacts and items related to food storage and preparation, food is a huge representation in the Kim Chung ledgers, representing of all eighty, representing eighty seven percent of a larger like the, the larger domestic category. Um, these include everything from flour, sugar, eggs, tea, different types of fish, uh, various types of meats, rice seeds and different condiments. Um, and obviously these include both culturally Chinese items and non-culturally Chinese uh, items or, or like non-cultural specific items. Um, what was really interesting was like mooncake was listed, um, but yeah, here you just kind of see a, a small example of what was there. Um, but these also contrast or these work in conjunction with like the Grant County English ledgers where there's purchases of things like old fudge or coffee, sugar, lemon, candy. Um, and these really, and as well as, you know, oysters and eggs and pineapple. Um, and these really demonstrate that Chinese immigrants maintain a traditional Chinese diet uh, while incorporating a lot of like the Euro-American or non-Chinese traditions. And like the presence of a lot of these like non-traditional or presence of these non-traditional Chinese treats also show the purchasing power that Chinese immigrants had in this larger anti-Chinese context. So just to be clear, like together, these really show that um, Chinese people were not isolated by any means and even despite a lot of restrictions that they had, like they could buy eggs either at the Chinese store or the American stores. <laughs> they had that ability. Um, now food in 
um, food in the archaeological context, such as Jacksonville mining camps, are mostly seen through miscellaneous cans um, and glass soda bottles, which you can see here in this like presence and absence chart. Um, the Kamwa Chung materials in itself had a lot of variety of condiments, um, fish, coffee, candies, and etc. Uh, so again, we kind of just see like this huge variety of the type of food that they were purchasing. In terms of clothing and footwear, which is the other type of artifacts that I looked at, all the assemblages, except for the mining camps, have relatively low representation. Um, clothing is represented in the archaeological assemblage largely through fasteners, such as buttons, buckles, rivets, and textiles, whereas footwear includes um, eyelets, boot or shoe parts made of leather bits, copper alloy, ferrous metals and rubber soles. For the mining camps, a large percentage of footwear is comprised <coughs> of hop nails that are put into the soles of the Euro-American manufactured rubber boot soles and heels in order to provide traction while working the muddy grounds. But these, these boot tacks were also put in there to really like extend the life expectancy of these shoes. Um, Clothing in Kamwa Chung ledgers uh, are dominated by silk scarves, while footwear includes a variety of shoes such as cloth shoes, warm boots, and leather boots. In this contrast, uh, the high percentage uh, and the great diversity <clears throat> of both the clothing and footwear in the Grant County ledgers. And clothing in this assemblage is represented by various overalls, jumpers, flannels, denim, blue jeans, undershirts, cashmere, and gloves. And footwear is represented almost exclusively by boots with occasional mention of slippers. Boot tacks are also mentioned um, specifically in these ledgers, and they may be referring to a lot of the hobnails that are found in Chinese mining camps. And multiple purchases of clothing and footwear may be indicative of the need to purchase these items more commonly due to <clears throat> use and need for replacements from wear and tear. Um, so Ultimately, my research really demonstrates that Chinese immigrants had access to all kinds of good they wanted because of the networks established by the Chinese Americans through the different associations that merchants were a part of. Letters in Chinese and English at Kim Chung <coughs> further adds the idea that merchants such as Liang Ang and Inghe were providing goods to populations all around Grant County, such as the places that you see here. Um, for those of you kind of not as familiar, <coughs> with um, Oregon. Uh, basically, I highlighted Portland for a reason, although Portland was one of the main places that they also had a contact with. But on the, here, let me just pull up. Um, this is, um, but yeah, here is Boise. So this is like the Idaho state line. So the Mahar National Forest is a, about, I think like a five hour drive from Idaho is really what it is. Um, so, Basically, all of these locations is where um, Kim Chung had direct contact with um, in terms of like direct letters coming in and out and specifically like Chinese people asking them for things. Um, not always necessarily goods, but sometimes it's literally asking for money kind of thing. Um, so the networks that were, that were set up were basically one of the many ways that Chinese Americans were resilient in these harsh times. Um, I think I need to. Okay, so um, these networks. Are, um, sorry, <laughs> my research demonstrates that Chinese immigrants had access to all kinds of good that they wanted. Um, and that the networks that was set up were, were one of the many ways that Chinese Americans were really resilient despite these harsh times. And uh, merchants were among the occupation class that had the most freedom and thus were able to kind of help set up um, others during these times. But also Chinese miners had the purchasing power to purchase both traditional Chinese goods and non-traditional Chinese goods, such as various sweets or coffee. Um, they purchased the necessary work-related clothing items from the stores that were that stocked them and not necessarily just the language or culturally convenient store, um, which demonstrates that the Chinese immigrants here had the financial power and therefore the choice in what to purchase from the goods available in these stores. Um, so how does this relate to the current situation Asian Americans are facing? Well, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak in January 2020, a lot of anti-Asian hate has gone up significantly in part due to media and, uh, and other racist rhetoric such as Kung flu and the Chinese virus. And these are really similar to a lot of the Chinese 
uh, anti-Chinese rhetoric used in the 19th and 20th centuries, such as China Man or, or Heathen Chinese. And even early stages, mass media in cities such as New York Post, um, which is the example here, used the image of Asian Americans and headlight related to COVID-19 articles that weren't necessarily related to the Asian American population. Not to mention the fact that I think this photo was actually a photo in, in Hong Kong, so not even related at all. <laughs> um, but the, the way that these terms and images are used with intention to scapegoat, deflect, and mirroring the tactics in the 19th century. Um, so various organizations and public figures are empowering the larger Asian American community in a variety of ways, such as through donations of the personal protection equipment and mo or money and like these guardian angels that formed in New York Chinatowns. But there's also campaigns such as Wash to Hate or Stop AAPI Hate that's also formed. So really Asian Americans are fighting the virus on every single platform from serving the front lines as various medical professionals to community organizers and artists and helping create awareness documenting this stories of anti-Asian activities. And as a whole, these efforts not only remind Asian American communities the resiliency of our communities and the histories that we have survived, but also emphasizing to continue to educate the larger public about our stories. Um, various types of organizations and networks in the larger Chinese community, such as Chinese Consolidated, such as Chinese Consolidated Vanilla Association or various tongs have always served to protect Chinese immigrants um, through stores such as Kamat Chung and company that served more than just a store, provided protection and security that added to the resiliency of Chinese immigrants. The building of Kamat Chung itself is a testament to the significance of two Chinese Americans in a very small majority white community. In fact, Eastern Oregonians have often credited uh, Kim Ah Chung's Ng He to protecting Eastern Oregon from the 1918 flu, which you see in an example of the prescription here. Um, even though Ng He was already 56 by 1918, his commitment to the community uh, beyond the Chinese community, which would have been in large decline at that point, is an important act that needs to be remembered. Also, during the Great Depression, Long An and Ng He kept their money in local banks to prevent the local economy from crashing. And Many residents to this day have very fond memories of Ying He Liang Ang, as well as the larger Chinese community in John Day. And according to oral histories conducted by the Friends of Kam Chung, Chinese people in John Day also helped local Euro-American children who were being bullied by neighbors. Um, the residents described the importance of Chinese minors to their communities and emphasized that without the Chinese population, John Day would not have been able to be as successful of a mining town. Um, when Bob Wa, which is Ying He's nephew, arrived in John Day, they were embraced by the remaining largely white community. Therefore, um, although Oregon Chinese Americans faced violence and discrimination in the 19th century, many Chinese American communities pushed through the hardships. And going abroad was really a beacon of hope, not just for Chinese individuals, but for whole families and clans. And Chinese par Americans participated in various occupations um, despite the racism that they had to endure, they were resilient and survived through it and were active members of their own community that extends beyond the media Chinese communities. And non-Chinese weren't just Kung Kong enemies or whatever we want to call them, but they also played active roles, active positive roles in Chinese American lives. Um, and so that's it. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, Lindsay, you're still on mute. Lindsay, you're still on mute. You're on mute. I'm still on mute. I thought I had undone it. Um, no, I love Inge Hay's, uh Spanish flu prescription and everything, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's just something about in 2020, 2021 that I'm like obsessed with anything from the Spanish flu epidemic, right? Like, I'm like, oh, it's the same thing. Um, yeah. So yes, everyone, if you have questions, you can either put it in the chat or in the Q&A and I'll ask. Um, but I have some questions to start off with. So um, when were these, some of these, so, cause, so some are from inventories and stuff, but some are from excavations. So when were the excavations done um, in some of these sites? Yeah, um, so the Jacksonville ones were conducted in 2011, 2013, and um, the uh, mining camps were mostly in 2018. And actually, this year we went back to one of the mining camps to do some more excavation that the data hasn't been updated for yet. Okay. 
Oh, very cool. So uh, what program is it under? Because at first I was like, oh, maybe it's, you know, like the national park or whatever, you know, yeah. thing yeah. that oversees it or whatever. So and no, where are they not. stored or whatever if someone <laughs> wants to go see things? Yeah, so the mining camps um, is in the Malheur National Forest, and almost every single year they have the pit project, which is called the Passport in Time. Um, they have ones, and I think this year they also went, yeah, this year they also went back to look at like Chinese sites as well, just because there's there's a lot out there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's honestly a wonderful collection, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Well, excellent. So um, just a few comments so far. Uh, Rhonda wants to say thank you. And William White says, great talk, excellent work. Um, we do have another question. It isn't necessarily related to your talk, though it could be, but what is your favorite artifact you have ever found either digging or in a collection or, you know, saw on a computer that, you know, in Google and you're like, I want that or whatever. <laughs> I don't know if this is necessarily my favorite, but I think one thing that always like really stood out to me was when I participated in one of the home villages excavation in China um, called the Taondong Village Project. And that was the home village. I was a 20th century site. Um, and we found fragments of undiagnostic whiteware. Um, and I just, you know, working in CRM long enough and being here long enough, just like that, those are things that were just like, whenever we find one, like, ugh, not again. Um, but then <laughs> just like finding that in China suddenly made that usually very bland artifact, no offense on dynastic whiteware, uh, to something that became very interesting. <laughs> Speaking of undiagnosed, I do love that it doesn't matter what culture, what community you're in, everyone has their, you know, redware, their, you know, brown glaze, <laughs> it's their Tupperware of their time, right? Like, just yes, throw exactly. everything in it. And that's really what CBGS is. <laughs> I just love that because it is such a thing. Everyone has that one type of wear type. Um, yeah. So we have another question. Oh, this is really good. I like this one. Um, what percentage of the immigrants were women? Do you know that? I don't know the numbers on top of my head, unfortunately, but we do know that there were a lot more restrictions on women coming over. Um, and because of that, there's been a lot more kind of like negative stereotypes associated with like women being here. It's like, oh, they must be prostitutes or whatever like that. Um, but it is, that's obviously not the case. And I think um, a book just came out on Polly Bemis um, by Priscilla Wagers that I, I have personally guiltily have not read yet. Um, but <laughs> it's worth checking out just because like the interest, because the, the, the story of Polly Bemis is, is legitimately really interesting. Um, but I, there was definitely less women because there were restrictions and like that like compares or contrasts a lot of the other kind of Asian American immigration. So they're not coming over as like family units necessarily. Unfortunately, they were there were a lot of quote unquote like paper sons, and also I think families were allowed to immigrate up to a certain point. But I genuinely do not remember that fact. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but there were paper sons because at one point they completely banned like a lot of migration, especially like unless they were family, um, and so it was like basically like Chinese people invented uh, family lineages in order to come to the U.S. and like they had to like basically like stick with like that story when they come here and so you know to this day you'll meet people's like oh yeah like my my great-grandfather was like a paper son or something like that. Okay um I have two questions that I'm going to kind of combine because they're very similar. So um, in terms of the excavations versus um, the historical documents, or I don't know if any of these um, objects were also found in museums and stuff like that. Um, was there any sort of wear type or category that you didn't find in the other? Like you only found it when excavating or you only found it in the ledgers and in the, you know, some other collection kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I don't quite remember because I didn't really specifically focus on like wear type. Um, yeah. Okay. And was there, did you guys see anything again, archaeologically or in the documents of reuse or relabeling of some of the, the containers or anything? Um, like the CBGS containers Probably, or just like yeah. in general? Um, 
I don't think we could see archaeologically necessarily, at least for the time being, although there's there, I, I do believe people are starting to do a lot more work on isotopes and stuff like that, um, not specific to these sites at all, that might be able to tell us a little bit more in terms of like the types of like containers and, and reuse and stuff like that. Um, although I'm sure they did. Like, <laughs> like Everyone, we said, like it was yeah, a Tupperware at the time. Right? Like, <laughs> until, until mold's growing on and you're like, I'm not opening the hat, right? Exactly. Um, so uh, two more questions. So one is, what have you specifically learned from the archeological field work related to this? Um, versus I think anything else. Specifically from the archaeology, ooh, I feel like that's a hard question. <laughs> Everything's so interwoven, right? You know. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh, that's. Uh, hold on, I need to think about that one for a second. Um, I guess it's for from the archaeology standpoint it's like kind of like knowing like understanding like the, the layouts and like the spaces that they occupied in the mountains and kind of the relationship and like specific to the mining camps I guess is what I'm thinking about right now is like the relation of like the the camps to like a lot of the mining features and kind of like the proximity also of like between like the mining mining camps with each other um and like I had this we had this conversation with the forest service archaeologists and you know it's like right now when we go through travel between these camps it feels like really long because we tend to like drive to them but like when you're cutting across the woods and stuff like that it's actually like maybe a, a few mile hike that kind of stuff um so like so that kind of stuff I think is really you you understand more from the archaeology um rather than anything else okay um and uh Actually, it will be the second to last question. Uh, is there any evidence of non-Chinese people buying any of these Chinese goods? Um, so we know for sure that Kama Chung, the store was visited not by, by also non-Chinese people. Um, I think there is a way to tell like non-Chinese people in the ledgers, but I'm still kind of like figuring out a way to prove that I'm right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah yeah you're like i have a feeling but you know if i'm gonna write this down we gotta we gotta have hard yeah. evidence. um okay so last question is um are we and by we we mean you and the team and everything able to document any descendants of these uh immigrants still living in the u.s and are any members of this community helping with this research or um anything like that yeah so we do we do um know of like Ing Hay's grandson or great grandson or something like that and he's back in China but in terms of other direct descendants of the com of the Chinese communities here in, in Oregon it's kind of a lot harder um, because like unlike California or like Seattle where there's a very strong kind of Chinese uh, presence to this day it's not nearly as strong in Oregon and I think it's just because of a variety of reasons that even now most of the Chinese populations in Oregon is in, is in Portland um, I am starting to work with uh, Chinese communities in Portland though um, I don't know that I'll be necessarily be able to find quote-unquote direct descendants necessarily but you know like they are very much like the community of <laughs> there so I am hoping to get them more involved in stuff. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you to our viewers for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which will be on Wednesday, September 22nd, when we are joined by Dr. Paulette Steves, who will be speaking about the indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. And again, we rely on support viewers like you, so consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So everyone, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, lots of fascinating lecture comments coming in, so well done. Thank have you. Have a great <laughs> afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye.